Hello and welcome to this special episode of the Career Success Podcast. I'm Jason Connolly. If you're a regular listener, it's great to have you back. But if you're new, welcome to the show. In this series every week, we speak to the biggest names in business all across the globe. We talk about their career stories, the lessons learned, how they've overcome obstacles and challenges and what success habits they practice. Practical advice to help you in your career. If you have a passion for business, then this is the podcast for you. In this special episode titled How Mindfulness Can Give You the Edge Over Your Opponent, I'm joined by Neil Seligman from London. Former civil barrister Neil is the founder of The Conscious Professional and a pioneer of the mindfulness and conscious leadership movement. As a sought-after international speaker, Neil delivers programs for companies and global law firms such as DLA Piper, Netflix, Hogan Lavelle's, Accenture RBS, Linklaters, RPC and Pinson Masons, as well as commenting and regularly appearing in both the national press and on television. Neil speaks at international conferences such as the Mindfulness India Summit in Mumbai, where he gave a keynote in November 2019. Neil is the author of two books, Conscious Leadership and 100 Mindfulness Meditations. Neil, thanks so much for joining me on this special episode. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me, Jason. So in this episode, we're going to talk, obviously, it's titled How Mindfulness Can Give You the Edge Over Your Opponent. But before we kind of come on to that and you introduce us to mindfulness, tell us a bit about your career and how the, how you've got to this place um, of, of what you're doing now, Neil. Absolutely. So it's a bit of an odd story, I suppose, a few different pathways um, that came to bring me to, to where I am right now. I was a barrister for about eight years, so graduated uh, law from Bristol Um, went on to study at the Inza Court School of Law and then was called in 2001 and um, practiced, well, had my tenancy first, my pupillage rather, um, at 12 Kings Bench Walk and then was lucky enough to take tenancy there. So that was sort of the start of it for me. I was really, you know, on track as a lawyer, as a barrister, and it was really the things that interested me in the background, which just very gradually sort of took took over um, and became much more sort of central passions to what I was, you know, really wanting to do in the world. So maybe a bit unusually, I, I had become a Reiki master um, in my late teens, which is wow. the type of sort of energy healing um, type of modality. And that had come across my path quite randomly. I was um, doing that sort of exchange program thing that you can do um, called BUNAC, where you could go and work in a kids camp in America. Um, and I yeah. did that, yeah, after I left school, I, I went out to the States in upstate New York um, and actually met a, an Australian guy from Melbourne who was a Reiki master and just so happened that, you know, he was talking about it a lot and I had a go at it. And it, it was really sort of quite a pivotal experience in my life when he did Reiki on me. Um, Tell us about it. What, what I've never had Reiki done to me, but I am someone who does believe in kind of spirituality. And uh, take me to Glastonbury on a day out, and I, I'm loving it every moment of it. So, tell us a bit more about that. Well, Reiki is um, it's an energy healing modality. People have sometimes come across it um, in spas, or you know, it's sort of a treatment that you can have. But when I came across it, I'd never heard of it, and um, but he was offering to sort of give me a go at it. And my actual experience was um, that I, I just felt things and saw things that I'd never felt or seen before. And I say seen, I mean sort of in my mind's eye. I had various visions and things, and it felt like almost like another dimension was opening up in my experience. Um, and certainly there was enough there that I thought, wow, this is this is really interesting. Like it, it's opening me up to something that feels real. And um, I just wanted to to understand more about it. So over the course of, you know, we were at camp for about two months. Um, he ended up training a, a few of us, about three of us in the, the first two levels of, of Reiki. And then I, I trained with him another year and took the, the third degree, which is kind of the master master degree. So yeah, it became quite a sort of central aspect. Even when I was a barrister, I had a little business on the side called the Holistic Life Practice, um, where I was offering Reiki healings and ended up doing some coaching and teaching meditation. Um, So I do that after after court and at the weekends and things like that. Um, Wow, that's really interesting. 
bit of an odd odd. Bar- no, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated already. I'm wondering more about what were the vision. How could you articulate the visions in the other dimensions you you were seeing? Because already I'm kind of interested, thinking what, what's that all about? Yeah. So I mean, it's it's quite a sort of personal experience, isn't it? These types of mm. things. I mean. The way that I would describe it is that I I felt like I was seeing myself in sort of other times and other places. It felt like I was seeing other sort of energetic beings, um, which I'd never experienced anything like that before. Physically, I could you know really feel heat coming from this Reiki master's hands, and at times I felt like my body you know felt different than it had before. Like at times I felt like I was levitating and you know, I wasn't but just wow. it was really you know it was a sort of a multi-dimensional sensory experience and, and I was sort of 18 or 19 at the time um so it kind of blew my mind um, it's quite a young age to learn something like that it seems to me yeah I mean it was it was really I guess who knows what is by chance what's not by chance I mean it maybe was the perfect thing for me at that moment you know, it turned out as we went into the training of it that I I sort of took to it quite naturally and and had a real kind of passion for it and and was able to develop a, a skill with it. So you know, and it's something that has sustained my interest over many years. And even though it's not, you know, healing is not a central aspect of the work that I do right now. It is something that some people do still know me for and occasionally come to me for you know energy work. So, yeah, so it's, you know, it's just a really interesting way in um, to another way of kind of experiencing the world, which, you know, for me, I sort of had this suspicion as a young guy that the world was kind of more about energy um, than about you know, a lot of things that people were talking about. And this kind of really locked in with that. It was like, OK, well, here's a kind of physical experience of how to energetically relate to the world and other people. And Reiki's got a really kind of useful aspect to it that it, you know, can have people can find it very calming, relaxing. You know, there are sometimes kind of physical aspects to the healing that can occur, things like that. So, you know, it, it just felt like a nice thing to be doing. And, you know, over the years has kind of just opened up the way in which I suppose I just work through my life really has this other aspect to it which feels very innate to me now and I've been able to kind of tie into the other aspects of you know professional excellence there are aspects in in which the way I learned those skills early on has really kind of taught me to relate to the world in a certain way it's really interesting I, I, I'm a big energy person myself so we'll have to talk more about Reiki towards the end for people wanting to learn a bit more but tell us a bit more kind of how your career progressed from there because we kind of talked about you've been 19 years old obviously this is something that you've been running alongside your current business but it, I, I guess this is, is is very pinnacle to your whole career your whole career seems like it's very much been shaped by that early experience in those early days and you know your, your career seems to have been built around that in some senses yeah kind of although I, I didn't really know how I could make a commercial success from that side of my work it was more a bit of a sort of passion project on the side and you know I was I was doing quite well as a barrister and so that you know certainly seemed like the more likely aspect where I was going to do well but I then had a chance conversation uh, with a, f- a friend from bar school. This was in about 2008, I think. And uh, yeah, just walking through the car park, um, my friend came up to me, another barrister, um, and said, hey, Neil, good to see you here. You're one of the rising stars of the civil bar. He heard something about me. And so nobody had ever said that to me before. So uh, that was a bit of a shock. But actually, when he said that to me, what I heard in my head was, your star is rising in the wrong field, you have to leave. So it was kind of this insight that landed, catalyzed by his comment, that really from that point, because it felt so true when that landed in my consciousness, um, that I changed direction entirely. Um, And within a few months, I'd I'd wrapped up my career as a barrister. Um, And so in 2009, yeah, I left. Wow. And where did it kind of go from there? So, um, <laughs> yeah. I find it really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love that though if there was some sort of, you know, and then instantly this kind of new mm. great sort of idea arrived and that was the thing. The, the 
sort of, you know, I don't know. This is kind of funny talking about this on reflection, how it all kind of happened in the timeline there. I think if someone actually went into detail with me about my background, it would be, you know, quite, quite the tale. Yeah, I mean, journeys never make sense when you're in them, do they? It's only when you're sort of towards the end of the journey, you can look back along the path and be like, okay, that, that's what was going on there. Yeah, no, no, um, I get that. I think especially recently, I think we've all had a lot of time. To yeah, so I mean, literally it took, it took three years for me to come up with the idea that was going to, you know, form the next chapter of my my life and career. And and very luckily I'd met just before this kind of insight landed, I'd met my meditation teacher who I've been uh, must have been working with now for about I say working with her as her student for about 14 years or so. And and so during that three years I was I was very much kind of going back to not to nothing, but going back to a very sort of reflective stage of, of you know, what all the questions, I could really consider them again. You know, what, what am I meant to be doing? What does my, you know, what does my energy want to be doing? Where does, where do I want to spend my energy in this lifetime? And I, I took quite a spiritual kind of way to explore that. And then, yeah, in 2012, in a meditation, I, I had this sort of download at, that the business was going to be called The Conscious Professional, um, I saw the logo and I heard that it was going to be centered around mindfulness and that mm. that clarity just sort of landed one morning and there it was. So interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, what a story. Okay. And then that's when uh, kind of this all, uh, this movement started for you. And then, because obviously you've, you've worked for law firms like DLA Piper, places like Netflix, Hogan Levels, the, the list just goes on and on. How did it go from that point to it being what it is? And how did you pitch this to, if that's even the right word, pitch it yeah, to business yeah, no, start no, using you in that way? Great question. So um, so it's 2012. I've got this clarity, but I do question it. Like in my mind, like mindfulness, like nobody, nobody knows about mindfulness in 2012. Like mm. nobody's heard of it. So I just start sort of pitching the idea to a few learning and development people that I know kind of on a personal level or have contacts with and say, look, I've got this idea. This is what I think I'm going to do. And pretty much everyone said, mm, no, we wouldn't buy that. that. That does not sound like something that we'd put our lawyers, you know, in front of. It definitely doesn't sound like the ordinary, but, you know. Yeah. Like, so I was getting like. How do you get it from that point? <laughs> Well, so the mindfulness piece seemed to be the scariest piece of it. So what I ended up doing was creating a course um, called Professional Resilience and having Mm. mindfulness as a module within that course. And this appeared to be more palatable (laughs) as a sort of set of words for lawyers. And I got my, so I remember this insight has happened in 20. Was that what you wanted to do that course at that point? Or was you wanting to expand on that section, but you thought, hang on a minute, I need to give them a small dose of this first of all, to show them the value that this could add. Yeah, it was almost like, you know, I just need to package this in the right way so that right. somebody will give it a try and that the mindfulness meditation piece doesn't feel too scary or central. So it's like, okay, well, we'll do a course and we'll talk a little bit about stress. We'll talk a little bit about emotional intelligence. We'll talk a little bit about digital well-being, personal well-being, and then we'll introduce mindfulness you know, briefly. You know, so that was the sort of package. And so this was, you know, because, you know, lawyers work hard and, you know, stress is always something that, you know, we're looking at new ways of, you know, how can we support people around that idea that was more palatable. And and so I got my, my first client was in 2014 and that was Pinsett Masons and, and just very gradually it grew from there. So, yeah, so no overnight success, very slow organic growth sort of one firm at a time and so on and you know just kind of just being really clear that you know I I really trusted that this is what I was meant to be doing um, and just kept going with it. Absolutely fascinating and I think that brings us really nicely on to the actual title of this episode how mindfulness can give you an edge over your opponent. Can you give us kind of an entryway into this topic that we're going to discuss um, today and uh, this, this special episode that we're making for people Give us a nice entryway into it, Neil, because I think this is a lovely juncture that we've arrived at now to kind of talk about the real meat of what we're getting down to today. Definitely, definitely. So the mindfulness piece for me, 
you know, I've always been more interested, really, rather than just telling people w- what it's all about and introducing mm. it and, and starting to, you know, guide people to feel comfortable in a kind of mindfulness experience. The even more interesting piece for me is like, what is the outcome if we can bring more of a mindful presence into our you know, everyday inner environment of just, you know, who we show up as, what becomes possible as a result of that? Um, and one of the things that I talk about a lot is that you know, mindfulness is really offering the map to allow us to explore and feel more comfortable with and more in control of our inner world of thoughts, emotions and sensations. So this kind of internal consciousness that we all sort of operate through on a day to day. And it really occurred to me, and this is one of the inspirations really behind my business, that the degree to which my peers and lawyers and myself and, and you know the people that I would come into contact with, the degree to which they were able to navigate their kind of external surroundings, their work, and show up with you know such a you know precise expression of, of excellence in those arenas was not always matched by their experience of navigating their inner reality. And it occurred to me that, you know, a lot of professionals that are doing very well and are very successful, their inner reality or their kind of inner experience of of their their life is sometimes quite stressful, frenzied, chaotic, anxious, not across the board. But it it seemed like, you know, this this was the sort of problem piece. It wasn't that people couldn't do the work. It was that they they weren't necessarily having fun. The emotion you d- arrived at throughout the the process of doing it, and at the end, wasn't maybe tied to what the actual success looked like. That yeah, their experience of expressing excellence was not necessarily fun for them. And in turn, the internal differs from the external. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think a lot of professionals that I've talked to over the years have kind of identified with that idea of kind of the swan, you kind of calm and serene on top, but then the legs kind of pummeling away underneath. And there's that slight feel within some of these professions that ask a lot in terms of pressure and time and hours and client care and all the rest of it. They ask a lot of people, you know, not just in those kind of physical aspects, but it's sort of emotionally as well. And from the perspective of retaining balance and well-being and perspective and all of those good things. And for me, mindfulness kind of offered this way into the inner experience of our world, our consciousness, with this map where if we can become more familiar with that map, we actually um, have a bit more control over how we navigate the day um, and what is our experience of navigating the day. You know, so you could call that stress resilience, call it building self-awareness, you could call it mindfulness, you could call it emotional intelligence. For me, they're, they're all really linked but the capacity for any human being to start to navigate towards a quiet space of being is quite fundamental to just feeling calm and confident in oneself. And when we don't feel like we have access to quiet within our world, because either the mind is so busy or you know, distracted or jumps from thing to thing, or you know, our, our inner world is characterized by anxiety or um, you know holding on tightly to make sure nothing gets dropped then that that can be exhausting yeah I agree and uh, so uh, let's kind of just uh, go into this a bit further so I'm someone who's thinking yes this is me I'm feeling those emotions yes okay I've got a lot of uh, and I think there's so, you know so many of us at the moment we're, we're not having a particularly great time it is harder than usual to do your job and whether you're working from home. And I think a lot of what you said earlier about communication in these current times is even more difficult. So tell us how we get, how do we get into mindfulness and how is this something that we can start practicing, identifying, relating to, and using that to to our advantage? I know we're talking about over one's opponent here, but, you know, let's talk about ourselves first of all. Yeah, so the thing with mindfulness at this point is that the, you know, such a proliferation of apps and books and and teachers and so on that can be a bit overwhelming in terms of well where does where does one start and my advice is always just to you know start with one thing you know maybe somebody recommends a book buy the book and read it twice you know that would be a mindful thing to do you know if you found a teacher that you like go onto an app like insight timer where there's a lot of free meditations from wonderful teachers all around the world 
what was that website? It's called Insight Timer. So it's both an app and a website. Oh, okay. And, you know, just... Even so- I'm writing it down. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, so for that teacher, yeah. have a look through their meditations, find one or two that you like and, and start doing them, you know, regularly. And when I say regularly, it doesn't have to be every day or twice a day. Regularly, you know, as you say, you know, if you want to get into meditation, start by meditating more than you are now. So if you're not doing it at all, try once a week. Um, you know, if you're already meditating occasionally, try, you know, a, a morning practice Monday to Friday, you know, just edge yourself gradually towards it. It doesn't need to be 20 minutes a day. Start with five. Start with really mm. small little moments that you gradually start to build into your day, into your week, into your habits. And over time, you know, even very small interventions like that, can leave us feeling in quite a different space than when we don't have them. Um, so start where you are, start with something, don't be overwhelmed and you know, keep it simple, keep it focused. I think that's really great advice. Um, and kind of talking about mindfulness and how, how it can make you better, what's the kind of journey that you think that you know, someone might experience having not done it to, to doing it? And how, is that kind of individual to each person or...? Tell us a bit more about the journey that people can go on using this and what that might look and feel like to them. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the mindfulness experience for each person is going to be individual. And, you know, the skills that we're learning through mindfulness are are quite simple. That doesn't mean they're easy to learn. But really what we're learning to do is to witness our thoughts, emotions and sensations which is kind of all there is in kind of the world of experience and to relate to them in a slightly different way. And so in mindfulness, we learn to witness the experience of our inner world without necessarily commentating on it, trying for it to be different than it is. We start to practice with intentions like practicing acceptance, practicing gratitude, learning how to open to our experience, whether it be pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, but opening to it from a space of self-compassion. And over time, really, we're just learning to relate kindly to ourselves. And it sounds like it's such a simple thing. But if you think about young children, you know, it takes quite a long time for children to learn how to relate kindly to one another. You know, there's a lot of tantrums, a lot of fights, there's a lot of, you know, you think of toddlers and so on, but we gradually learn, oh, you know, this is how we relate to other human beings. We can be friendly with them. We can be kind to them. They can support us. They can form part of our community and, you know, we can feel nurtured by it. And yet sometimes our experience with with self never went that, you know, through that same education. Um, certainly most, most people of my generation um, you know, never got any sort of mindfulness training or emotional intelligence training at school. And so, you know, we ended up being really good at navigating our external reality and not so great at navigating our internal reality. It should be something that really gets taught to, to people quite young, because I like to think that I'm, I'm I'm very emotionally intelligent. It kind of maybe comes with, I always say to people with the kind of counterbalance, that I'm an emotional person. But I understand emotions and how to navigate them. I think that's what's made me successful in working in a people's um, business. But surely a lot of these skills and these life skills, what? why are these not taught? So it is changing. So a lot of these things are being taught now. Where are they being taught? <laughs> so in schools. Um, oh, really? Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, there's, a, there's some fantastic programs out there for children. Um, the dot p dot b program the pause b program you know i imagine a lot of parents who are listening have probably heard of those because their their children you know will will be in programs like that you know i've had the opportunity to speak in different countries and sometimes you know i've, I've done a piece on mindfulness and the lawyers or you know, professionals will come up and say oh my my kid <laughs> told me to take a mindful moment the other day when i was stressed out because they'd learned it at school yeah, so there is. Well, that's a really good thing, but that's that is the idea that realised that was that had been introduced. Yeah, that was it, news to me. It's not everywhere, and it's you know it's not every school, um, but it's it's becoming more and more widespread. And there's great training programs for for teachers um, who are then able to you know actually pass on these skills, and um, you know that that 
you know, the mindfulness in schools project is the one that I did my training with for the for the children's program. And yeah, it's a fantastic training. I really can't recommend it enough. Is there kind of a common thing that you tend to find that when you go into a business, is there something that you tend to find, oh, this is a usual thing that always comes up again and again, and this is something that businesses don't do right? Or it, it, do you find that there's a typical set of circumstances that you tend to arrive at when you, you go into these environments that you're being uh, paid to consult for? I would say probably stress, you know, is is the sort of number one thing that, you know, we're, we're looking for new ways of allowing people to feel confident around their stresses and mindfulness, you know, is, is a great intervention for that. So, you know, the mindfulness based stress reduction program, which was the one developed in the seventies by John Kabat-Zinn and has become kind of the gold standard of mindfulness courses. You know, there's, there's a reason why it's called mindfulness based stress reduction is because mindfulness allows us to relate to you know, the things that we find stressful in a in a new and different way. And if we can have more control over, you know, our stress reactivity, which gets triggered so often, you know, in a work environment, you know, it used to be triggered in tribal times when a tiger walked around the rock, but now it's triggered by a scary email from our boss or a, you know, a, a rude email from a client. You know, we go into a sort of fight or flight state. And That's really interesting. Uh, as we... As we come to the the journey of mindfulness, we get to kind of be the witness of this reactivity within the body and the mind. And over time, we can we can find new ways to remain grounded, to remain connected to ourselves, to be able just to take another breath before going into the habit of gearing up for for panic or you know going into action. So it resources us in a different way. And uh, we're kind of coming to the end of our time together. I think what you've said is really interesting. You're author of two books, Conscious Leadership and One Hind- uh, sorry, 100 Mindful Meditations. Tell us a bit about those books and what you know led you to, to write them and what, you were, what was the kind of mission for, through publishing those books to kind of bring out there to, to the wider world? What's your message? Oh, yeah. So um, the first one that I wrote is called 100 Mindfulness Meditations. And that one was published in 2016. And I wrote it in about six months after having tried to write a book for about four years and failed. And then I had this brand new idea for a book. Did you fail the other times when writing? I think because the book wasn't ready yet. I was just like, I wrote a lot of stuff, but it just never turned into a book. But this idea came along and it was to write like a recipe book of meditations. And it really appealed to me because I I really like variety in my meditation practice. Personally, I like to, you know, try different things and it to be related to what I'm going through in the day. And if I'm trying to be creative, do one for that. If I'm, you know, working with some difficult emotions, meditate around that. Um, and so I wanted to put together, a, you know, this kind of recipe style book of meditations um, to act as kind of inspiration to meditation teachers, but also inspiration for anyone who's, you know, a regular practitioner um, just to to inspire their practice. OK, and uh, tell us a bit about conscious uh, leadership and, and how that came about and what's the uh, message worth, the message for people there. Yeah, so the conscious leadership one is really the journey of mindfulness applied to the art of, it's more self-leadership, really. So in the book, in the beginning, you know, I I sort of talk about how everyone is a leader because, you know, you are, you're the person who is responsible for your thoughts, actions and behaviours. And over time, that translates into a sort of degree of, of mastery of the human process. And as we're moving through our our journey work or, you know, even in all sorts of different kind of scenarios where we're impacting upon others, it's about bringing more self-awareness to that journey, learning the skills of self-maintenance, self-development, self-realization. And so it's really that sort of harmonic journey of how do we step into becoming all that we are. So I, I kind of just wanted to make a really practical guide and and summarize quite a lot of the the main points that I teach in the courses with my corporate clients and make it accessible through a book as well to to others. 
Absolutely fascinating, Neil. I think everything you've said made perfect sense to me. And, you know, I found myself frantically writing down the <laughs> things you were saying there. If people want to find out more about you, where can they go to? So the consciousprofessional.com is the main website of my business. I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, all of the socials. My public site is neilseligman.com as well. So you'll see books and retreats and events and things listed there. Thank you, Neil, so much for joining me on this special episode titled How Mindfulness Can Give You the Edge Over Your Opponent. That was Neil Seligman. I'm Jason Connolly. This was the Career Success Podcast. Until next time, goodbye.